Luck as a skill is a phrase many people have heard before. While generally more apparent in something like a trading card game or even gambling, Heart of the cards. Guide me. Time and time again we've seen this luck-based lifestyle find its way into fighting games. Despite remaining a consistent archetype in the genre for years now, no character has encapsulated this sentiment quite as well as Hero in Smash Ultimate. Similar variants exist elsewhere in Smash, see Peach Turnip Pulls or Game & Watch Judge Hammer, but never before has it been a centerpiece of a character's design. The Grandfather of RPGs was released back in July of 2019 as the second character of the first Fighter's Pass, with the anticipation for his release being astronomical. The concept of Hero was unique from the beginning. In simplest terms, he's a sortie that possesses decent range with lackluster frame data. This is paired with his mana bar, a meter-based mechanic that Hero uses to cast his array of special moves. His main draw is his down special, the menu, which is what made RNG Hero's specialty. This powerful mechanic provides Hero with access to 21 possible spells with a range of different effects. This can make it tricky for him though, as every one of his special moves is linked to this mechanic, so no mana means no recovery. From Monado Art S buffs he can place on himself, projectiles which vary in speed and potency, quick slashes used for edge guards and discouraging rushdown, enhanced recovery, and even a heal he can use twice per match, Hero provides you access to just about anything you could ask for. But the menu gives and the menu takes. The catch to all of this is that Hero is only given access to just four spells anytime he presses down B. In case you wanted more RNG, these spells are also randomly generated every time Hero accesses the menu. As a result, feelings towards the Fighters Pass 1 oddball are extremely varied throughout the community. Some people, including one we'll be talking about later in this video, think he's an unviable clunker, while others aggressively want him banned, claiming he's anti-competitive. As time went on, the meta developed and Hero took a backseat to better and more consistent and options, including many of the DLC that followed his release. It seemed like true hero players just couldn't seem to stack the deck in their favor. That was until Kagari B3, where a Japanese hero player Akakitsu cemented himself as the best hero to ever do it, going on a run of a lifetime that resulted in an astounding third, by far his best placement to date. In the process, he defeated many pillars of Japan Smash, such as Raito, Shikai, and most notably defeating Japan's number one player at the time, Zachary. He ended up falling to Atelier and T, who were both near their peaks skill-wise, and proved that he was truly one of the strongest in Japan. While Akakitsu was undoubtedly a strong player before this, boasting wins on players like the aforementioned T and putting up very consistent strong offline placements, this was the first time the whole world had their eye on the hero genius. Many thought the stars aligned for Akka on his first run, but no, the top hero managed to follow this up with a top 8 at the following Kagaribi. To date, he has remained unbelievably consistent with a character who breathes inconsistency. His lowest offline placement to date has been 129th, but he generally appears anywhere from 25th to 7th at the biggest events in Japan. His title of the world's best hero main seemed like a foregone conclusion, but Recently, a new challenger for the title has been stepping up in a big way. Enter Beast Mode Paul, CFL native and hero Sephiroth co-main. Like many other modern-day Ultimate players, Paul started on his competitive journey in 2020, which should also be noted as nearly a decade after many of Ultimate's household names like Tweak or DeBuzz. Even newer age competitors like Spargo and Sonics have over double this time under their belt. But getting his start during the quarantine Wi-Fi days, Paul immediately saw success as he transitioned to his offline local scene. It was at these locals where we began to see Paul rack up an occasional top 50 level win versus players like Jake and Goblin, and it became clear pretty fast that there could be something special with this kid in due time. Where Paul seemed to face the most resistance was on the national stage though. Some inconsistency in closing out big wins at the local level shined through at these majors, clocking in placements like 65th at LTC and CEO 2021. These results were honestly great, considering his lack of experience up until that point, but still, at that moment he wasn't catching many eyes of the greater competitive scene, which was honestly a shame, because with time on his side and a clear passion to prove himself, Paul quietly started putting together a hell of a resume. He closed out 2021 with a 25th at the Smash World Tour Last Chance Qualifier. As the results piled in, it became harder and harder to deny that BMP stocks were on the rise. He managed to claim incredible placements like 49th at CEO and 33rd at RNG, but still though, BMP's time was heavily split between Hero and a Fighter's Pass 2 edition in Sephiroth, which kept Paul out of the conversation of best Hero player. Where it's like with Hero, I don't really like believe in Hero in terms of like, will he be able to take me to the best? I really don't.
That being said, as the start of the new year came, we saw his priorities begin to change. Now in 2023, we saw the year of the beast. Paul saw a slow start to 2023 with an unexpected 129th at LMBM, which he would not take lying down. In the words of Big Gob, The comeback is always greater than the setback. A stronger 49th at Collision 2023 started Paul's momentum shift, bringing him the confidence to secure back-to-back -back top eights at Gateway Legends and CEO 2023 with wins on the likes of Mutaste, Icy Mist, and Jake, all with Hero. Paul followed this with a respectable 65th at Super Smash Con 2023 and a pretty big underperformance at Cirque du CFL 2, finishing 33rd. This pair of results was well below the mark of what Paul was capable of producing, especially given how explosive of a run he had been on so far this season. Fast forward to October of 2023, where we saw the accumulation of Paul's seemingly endless grind finally pay off. With a run including wins on players like Rock, Apollo Kage, and Skinny the Pooh, we saw the hero savant finish up Rewired Fest 2023 with an amazing 5th place. Beating a variety of competitors, all with Hero, Paul showed that he was truly putting himself in contention as the character's strongest representative in the world. This performance at Rewind Fest was followed by back-to-back -back 17ths at the pair of majors LMMM and Poor Priority 8. Paul's home field advantage proved useful in Miami, taking down Yuno, Peebnut, and a fellow CFL resident in Kobe during his run. Then in Seattle just a few weeks later, Europe seemingly had no answer for the young hero player at one of the biggest events of the year. The gauntlet of Andres FN, Siski, and Gluttony fell short against Paul at the event only managing to take a single game between the three best of five sets. This run in the back half of 2023 has proven Paul a consistent top-level threat in only his third year of competing. Being many players' final event of the year, Santa Paws had bigger implications than originally anticipated. It marked the end to a truly historic year in Ultimate's lifespan, providing us with an amazing event all while giving back to charity and giving three dogs forever homes. While most of Ultimate's spectator eyes were on Watch the Throne that weekend, which we covered in this video, and you should totally check that out if you haven't, Beast Mode Paul proceeded to put on a show where for anyone that did tune in or for any of the unfortunate souls to run into him in bracket won't soon forget. At first glance, a regional with just 181 entrants seems almost underwhelming, but looking into the bracket, you'll see that there was no shortage of top-level talent in attendance. With players like Cola, Onan, Shattuck, Big D, Shiny Mark, and Lima just being a few of the names worth mentioning, all looking to make one final push for the year, a strong performance this weekend would be a difficult task for any player. BMP kicked off his weekend with a relatively calm round one in pools. This was followed with Paul being thrown directly into the thick of things, with every following set being an absolute battle. In winter Winners round 2, Paul found himself sitting next to MDVA resident Squid Plumber, one of NA's top Belmont representatives, notably top 8 in Glitch Regen. Hero is notorious for gatekeeping the many zoners Smash Ultimate has to offer due to his disjointed normals, his long range, and disjointed side B, which lets him poke at these characters from a safe distance. On top of that, the bounce spell is essentially a huge middle finger to every zoner in the game. This spell applies a passive buff to Hero that automatically reflects all projectiles. Since the set did not appear to be recorded anywhere, likely due to its nature of being an early pools match, it's safe to assume that Paul made strong use of these tools to cleanly take the set 3-0. So who could possibly follow up as Paul's second opponent of the day? None other than Luminosity's own and Lumi rank number 29, Big D. The Ice Climber Extraordinaire is widely agreed upon as the strongest representative of the character in the world. Unfortunately, this was another off-stream set, so we once again turn to matchup theory to help us better understand how these two players have to go about fighting each other. Ice Climbers is a bit of an oddball matchup for any character to have to craft a game plan for. Between multiple hurt boxes, creating different combo routes, mechanics tailored to them involving Nana AI and desyncing the climbers, very oppressive combos and setups themselves due to high damage output, and being able to throw out multiple options at once. On top of all of this, they're being piloted by Big D, being a one-of-a-kind talent with more years of experience competing than many others have even been playing Smash in general. So, once again, Hero's large disjoints take the spotlight here. His sword lets him swing at the ice climbers without exposing his body, meaning that if he were to connect an attack on one climber without hitting the other, his potential for getting reversaled is rather minimal. Moves like Hero Side B also have very high base knockback, which allows for easy separation of the climbers and can also lead to early loss of nano stocks. Once again, Paul was able to secure the set with a strong 3-0, which was an incredible upset under the young hero's belt and a great way to close out his day one. Surely feeling great about his performance so far, BMP started day two with a long-awaited run back against Tri-State Prodigy Syrup. These two had last faced offline at Glitch Regen over a year prior, where they had a nail-biter game five set that concluded with Syrup narrowly closing out the win. BMP was coming Coming back with the Vengeance, and Vengeance is what he arrived with, taking this set in 3-0 fashion. He now picked up two Lumi rank level wins without even getting into top 16, furthering his dominance in the bracket so far with zero games dropped. In winner's quarters, we saw Paul going head-to-head -head with the best Pikachu in the world, Shiny Mark. 
And from the start, Shiny Mark made it clear he was willing to play the slow game, using T-Jolts to harass Hero and stop him from rolling his menu freely. This was paired with expert use of Quick Attack, abusing its burst range to win neutral if he noticed a mistake or if Paul wasn't respecting the option. After that, he would abuse Hero's poor landing options, and the fact that he's not only linear, but also relies on a resource-based system. That's one of his main weaknesses, making it clear when it's time to push the pace against this character. This in particular led to not only a ton of chip damage, but a multitude of early stocks. From the Hero point of view, Paul countered Shiny Mark by using a lot of menu in the corner outside of the range of Quick Attack to roll for his high impact buffs and his longer range projectiles in an attempt to make his life a little bit easier in neutral. This also allowed him to passively gain the ability to outpace Pika through increasing his damage output to easily stack damage off raw hits or even find kills extremely early. Games 1 and 2 were very hard fought on both sides, with the first coming down to a tight last hit where Shiny Mark abused Pikachu's awkward shield stun on dash attack to get a spot dodge up smash, and in game 2 he sealed the game with an early edge guard after draining Hero of his mana off stage. Against a character like Pikachu and a player like Shiny Mark, being down 2-0 is not the position you want to be in, especially with a character that can be seen to have so much variance. But in Game 3, we saw the return of some life from Paul. He came in hot with a crazy Kaboom confirmed to start the game and ended up closing it out with a JV2, getting himself on the board. In Game 4, his winner's bracket fate was sealed though. Despite an early SD from Shiny Mark, his expert eye for offstage kills proved too much to fight through at this point, and Paul was sent into the loser's bracket. Paul's loser's top 8 qualifier was Dreamhack Atlanta champion Peebnut, further cementing that Paul had no easy rounds at any point during this event. While the set was very competitive with every game but one coming down to last stock, Hero's access to the bounce spell combined with Paul's near instant menu selections meant that the buff was applied more often than not during the duration of the set. With Bounce active, almost all of Mega Man's moves become detrimental to use since they're all projectiles. This allowed Paul a sense of near freedom, and he was able to play to his strengths better than nearly any other hero could in this set, securing his place in loser side top 8 with a 3-1 victory. In loser 7s, it was time for Paul and Big D to face each other for the second time in this event. This was a collision of two absolute forces, both coming off monstrous runs. If we're being truthful though, there was no other way to describe this set other than dominant. Paul's menuing proved itself as his most valuable asset once again, since he was able to play at a speed rarely seen from a character as clunky as Hero is known to be. Lightning fast selections allowed him to abuse his best tools in that matchup, being his projectile spells as we mentioned before, while weaving in high impact buffs such as Psych Up to put on stock threatening pressure at early percents, and Bounce which reflects Ice Climber's ice block and prevents them from applying pressure while the menu is online. With games 1 and 2 taken in a 2 stock and having solid control of game 3, Paul eliminated Big D from the bracket and advanced to Losers' quarters with yet another strong 3 0. With runbacks almost being a theme for Paul during this bracket, his quarters match was against the man who took him out of winner's bracket at poor priority, Cola. Roy is notably one of the few matchups Paul opts to go Sephiroth in, so for the first time of the event, we saw BMP bust out his secondary. While Sephiroth's above average edge guarding potential gave this idea clear merit, Cola is a world class player and was able to seal game one with a convincing two stock. This was now the fourth game in a row that Paul had lost to Cola with Sephiroth, and against his very own judgment, he made the decision to try to make some magic happen locking in Hero like he'd been doing all day. The decision paid off huge as Paul went on to seal out Game 2 with a low percent one stock off the back of an extended edge guard sequence involving Kukrackle Slash and a Kaswoosh stage spike. Cola fired back in Game 3 though with a JV3 stock, combining his natural aggression with some of the most creative side B usage we have ever seen from the best Roy in Ult's history. This performance put Paul's back up against the wall, having no more room to make mistakes in the matchup. And up until now, we haven't seen Paul go to Game 5 at all in this bracket, with his only game losses before this set being the ones lost to Shiny Mark, so now is the time where a player must find a new gear to shift into and forge on. Game 4 begins, and Paul hadn't missed a beat, showing us one of the fanciest accelerator combos to date. A very disciplined and space control centered style to limit Cola's aggression with back airs and projectiles in turn bought him the time he needed to roll for accelerator and create meaningful openings. The game was a seesaw the entire time, but in the end we saw Paul run away with it, closing it with an up smash platform tech chase and tying the set at 2 and 2. In the last game, Cola decided to deviate from PS2 and counterpick to Hollow Bastion for the smaller stage length and shorter blast zones in order to counteract Paul's defense play. Cola got off to a characteristically hot start with an early ledge trump kill, but BMP slowly pulled the game back by adopting his more menu-focused style, allowing him to find quick tools to control large amounts of space and prevent Cola's rushdown. This game truly came down to the wire, and through a hatchet man attempt, a couple well-timed kabooms, and a more than clutch fair two-frame on Roy's up B, Paul managed to put it all together and close out the set, continuing his Cinderella run. But now Beast Mode Paul gonna be able to get the 
forward air and the pop off. Beastmo Paul will be defeating the number one seed of Santa Paws Cola and moving on into loser semis. Semifinal saw Paul matched up against Omega, the United States best Joker player, who was also on quite a run himself, taking down Onan, Lima, and DJ Don before this. A notoriously rough hero matchup, Joker's offstage gun pressure and his very safe neutral allow him to apply lots of pressure to menu on stage and threaten stocks at nearly any percent offstage. If this set had one defining factor from start to finish, it was how evenly matched both competitors were throughout. Every single game was within one stock, just one hard read away from closing out each, creating a very explosive tempo throughout the set. Once again, we saw a Game 5 situation here, bringing the absolute peak of this matchup. And while this set had been dead even nearly every step of the way, it was closed out with a hatchet man in neutral, one of Hero's worst spells due to its Falcon Punch level startup. Only Paul could ever explain this decision, and maybe that's why he's up there instead of anyone else. Three sets to go to take home the gold, and waiting in losers finals was the man who put Paul in there in the first place, Shiny Mark. There were three key factors that contributed to the outcome of this set. One, Paul placed a higher priority on bounce and neutral, turning Pika's layered and safe pressure with approaching T-Jolt into linear and scary since he now has to throw his stubby hitboxes into Paul's threat bubble. Two, Paul gave nearly zero openings for approaching Rising Bear from Pika, meaning his neutral losses were less impactful and he let his trades create an advantage over time. And three, Paul focused on rolling Zoom offstage instead of recovering normally, which meant he stopped losing early stocks offstage and he was living for nearly 130 extra percent each game. This also forced Shiny Mark to kill him on stage and allowed for infinitely more room for outplay potential since his stocks held more value. With these three adjustments in play, some very timely zoom luck, and an airtight game plan, Paul managed to bring the set to another decisive Game 5, where he ended up securing his place in Grand Finals with a 3-2 victory and a well-deserved pop-off. I come to a close, that's a full charge, that might kill, yes it will, fully charged! Only one challenger remained though, and who other than North America's top rising star as of late, Shattuck. These two players were not seated to be here, but they truly earned their spot and then some. This match held meaning beyond what the set count would tell you. It was hard fought from Paul, but Shattuck seemed to be a bit too poised and prepared for the encounter. Shattuck picked apart the hero with a 3-0 and secured his largest event win to date, taking the crown as the Santa Paws 2023 champion. It can't be understated how impressive Beast Mode Paul's run to second at Santa Paws truly was. Every single player that he faced after round one had made top eight at a major before, a fact that doesn't even really sound correct when it's said out loud, especially for an event of this size. He took dominant three zeros, fought from one to two deficits, and even beat the player who took him out of winners, all feats requiring rock-solid mental fortitude to see it all the way through. While he hasn't gotten that true major top eight like Akakitsu has in the past, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that Paul has taken the title as best hero in the world. So don't be all that surprised if you continue to see his name among major top 32s and beyond. It seems all but a sure thing at this point. And if you're ever unlucky enough to go head to head with him in bracket, don't even think about trying to outread him. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you like these kinds of videos, please subscribe and drop a like down here. It really does mean a lot, especially on a brand new channel. And I hope to see you back here soon.